obviously there are some restrictions in place and one of those restrictions is a court order saying that the member of the royal family's name is not allowed to be made public. Of course, that leaves anyone watching simply wondering. Thank you. Now, it would be the most radical shake-up of Parliament in more than a century, only allowing English MPs to vote on matters solely affecting England. That's a bold idea from former Conservative Minister Malcolm Rifkind, who says such a move would only be fair in a devolved Britain. Our political correspondent Chris Shipp is live at Westminster. Chris. Tony, the great power giveaway that was devolution never addressed the issue that on uh, English-only matters, why MPs from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland still uh, get to have their say. Today, the Tories came up with a plan to let you know how, uh, quite how complicated it would be. Our Scottish-born British Prime Minister would no longer have a say uh, on English matters. And I think if you understand that, you understand why on this one there's no simple solution. In the political world, it is the new north-south divide. MPs here can't vote on matters which affect only people here. So why can Scottish MPs still vote on matters which affect only people in England? It's the big question left unanswered by devolution. Today, the Tories put forward a solution to push Scottish, Welsh and Northern Irish MPs out of the Commons on English-only matters. But when you're dealing with English health or English housing or English education, I'm suggesting that should be actually handled by an English Grand Committee within the House of Commons, and the English Grand Committee would come to a decision on that. Now look at the senior members of government who would be denied a vote. The Prime Minister Gordon Brown, the Chancellor Alistair Darling, Defence Secretary Des Brown and International Secretary Douglas Alexander. They'd all be stripped of their right to vote on the NHS, on schools and housing in England. It's right that you look at the Constitution from time to time and see where you can devolve power. But I don't think it's right to break up the United Kingdom. And I think that that's where ultimately the suggestion of the Conservatives would go. But for Scotland's Nationalist First Minister Alex Salmond, the call for English votes for English MPs suits him just fine. Every passing day of being Scotland's First Minister makes me more and more certain of the need for Scotland to have the full powers of an independent country. And in making capital out of Gordon Brown's Scottishness, David Cameron risks playing into the hands of the SNP. Emphasising division can only help the nationalist cause. So Chris, how is Gordon Brown going to solve this particular problem then? Well, not very easily. Uh, critics of the team say it will uh, create several tiers of MPs uh, here at the House of Commons. They all come together for things like foreign affairs, for taxation, for defence. Only English MPs would then vote on English NHS, English housing, uh, English schools. For the Tories, it's a matter of uh, arithmetic. They've got 195 MPs, one of whom is in Scotland, three of whom are in Wales. You can see why it works. But Labour say, where does it all end? Do any coastal MPs... Uh, vote on fishing? Do any rural MPs vote on fox hunting? This one uh, will run and run, I think. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Now, bringing knife crime under control on our streets appeared to get a little tougher today as new figures revealed the true extent of the problem. Every 24 minutes in Britain, someone somewhere falls victim to an attack, with some of our biggest cities attracting the biggest problems. Some viewers may find images of the victims of knife crime in Sama Siraj's report disturbing. The figures speak for themselves, but is anyone listening? Five and a half thousand serious knife crimes in the UK in just three months this year. That's one every 24 minutes. Of those, 55 were murders. Every day when our children, and our children, getting killed by other children, they're telling you something, they're telling you, we can't walk on our streets. We're scared. There used to be a time when if someone argued with you, you'd, you'd argue, you'd say words and walk away. They're not walking away now. Jan lost her 17-year-old daughter Danielle in June this year. She was stabbed and beaten up in broad daylight. Danielle never carried a knife. Danielle was never involved in a gang. When you carry a knife and people know you carry a knife, they can expect you to use it. The Home Office says crime and violent crime have fallen by a third in the last 10 years. Here in Chingford, East London, they are hollow words. Well, I don't like walking down the street. Like, I'm always like looking around, like thinking that like, someone might just pop out in front of me with a knife or a gun, whatever. The police ain't doing nothing about it. 
I don't think Jupe is going to get any better. Danielle's friend Sophie wrote a poem about her death. She says no one listens to their problems. I sent it to Gordon Brown, but he he never replied. So I said to him in a, another letter, I said my poem actually proved the point then. Tonight a memorial concert is being held for Danielle. Her family have released a disturbing image of her before she passed away. They want everyone to see the person behind the knife crime statistic. The government insists it's doing all it can. A knife amnesty last year saw more than 90,000 blades handed in and they've increased the maximum penalty for carrying a knife in public from two to four years in jail. A small comfort though for the family and friends of Danielle Johnson. Samus Siraj, ITV News. At least seven people were killed by a suicide car bomber in the northern Iraqi city of Kirkuk today. The massive explosion near a bus terminal ripped through shops and set cars ablaze. People say around 25 people were also wounded in the blast. The death toll was kept relatively low because many of the shops were shut. Turkish troops killed 20 Kurdish militants in a major operation in the east of the country. The operation involving 8,000 troops with air support was not in an area close to the Iraqi border. There are no details of army casualties. Now, as the smoke finally clears from parts of Southern California's smouldering landscape, the hunt's begun for arsonists thought to have started several of the devastating wildfires. Defiant and determined, the message from State Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger was all too clear. We will hunt you down. Rohit Kachru reports. Having fought the worst of the flames, there is a new offensive in California. The arsonists blamed for starting the deadly wildfires that caused so much damage and so much trauma were given an unmistakable warning from the state governor. If I were one of those people who started the fires, I would not sleep soundly right now, I tell you, because we are right behind you. As a matter of fact, if I would be you, turn yourself in. Ugly, uh, talking about the ugly side of human behavior, we are also going after the scam artists, the price gouges, the insurance ripoffs, and the shady contractors, and anyone else that preys on the people that have been hurt by those fires. For many of those now able to return to a home that is still intact, there is new hardship. In the town of Ramona, returning residents are finding that fighting the wildfires drain the reservoir and local supplies. Van loads of water are being brought in from outside for the needy. And in those few homes that have supplies, the water isn't safe to drink. Yes, tastes very salty. It tastes salty. I don't know, a lot of salt or bleach or whatever. It goes. That's what I think. I don't know. I wouldn't drink that stuff. This U.S. Air Force image shows the trail of one of the fires. It's left air pollution so bad, some people are being told to stay indoors. But for many of those with a home to stay in, it's a problem they're willing to endure. Rohit Katru, ITV News. On to today's sport now, and Arsenal are back at the top of the Premier League tonight after a one-all draw with Liverpool in a thrilling encounter at Anfield. Steven Gerrard opened the scoring for the Merseysiders, but a late equaliser from Cesc Fabregas enabled the Gunners to regain top spot from Man United. Matt Rumsey, watch the action. Liverpool boss Rafael Benitez was scribbling away before the home side took on Arsenal at Anfield. Things have not gone to plan for Liverpool so far this season and even untouchable Steven Gerrard has come in for some criticism. Here was the England star's answer. Just seven minutes played, Arsenal were a goal down. Gerrard leading from the front as usual. Youngsters, watch this closely. It's straight out of the coaching manual. Beautifully struck. 1-0 at the break. The second half was all about Arsenal's Cesc Fabregas. The 20-year-old was gifted an opportunity to level the scores, but appeared not to have read that manual. Redemption, however, came in the 79th minute. Fabregas put his toe in the right place at the right time, and the teams were level. The Spaniard almost won the match for Arsenal. He hit Liverpool's post, but the match ended a point apiece. Enough to take Arsenal back to the top of the table. Matt Rumsey, ITV News. There were three other Premier League matches played today. Bolton managed a one-all draw against Aston Villa at the Reebok Stadium. Nicholas Anelka scored first for Gary Megson's home side. Substitute Luke Moore saved Villa with a goal in the second half.
Here's confirmation of those results, plus the rest of today's Premier League scores. Everton beat Derby 2-0 at Pride Park, and it finished Tottenham 1, Blackburn 2. On to the Scottish Premier League, and Rangers suffered a 2-1 defeat against Dundee United at Tannadice. A goal from Lee Wilkie and a successfully converted penalty from captain Barry Robson helped United to their third consecutive league victory. Celtic stay top of the SPL. Elsewhere in the SPL, Aberdeen and Falkirk drew one all. British tennis star Andy Murray has won the St. Petersburg Open with a straight sets victory over Fernando Vadasco of Spain. The 20-year-old Scott impressed his Russian host by taking the match 6-2, 6-3. The result takes Murray up to 11th place in the ATP Tour rankings. Finally, to some, he's an artistic genius whose work is snapped up by Hollywood's A-list for a cool million pounds. But in the eyes of Hackney Council, the artist known as Banksy is more of a menace blighting London's East End with his distinctive graffiti artwork. So they've decided to curb his artistic genius by blasting it all away. Simon Newton reports. Some say he's a graffiti genius. Others are subversive with a spray can. Banksy's street art has gained him cult status, with canvases of his work fetching thousands of pounds. But not everyone seems to appreciate the art world's man of mystery. Most of Banksy's work, like this young angel, have appeared on the walls of East London. In the borough of Hackney, 30 pictures have popped up in the last seven years. But now a blitz on graffiti means the council's about to blast away Banksy forever. Like councils across Britain, Hackney has a zero-tolerance policy on graffiti. And that means whether it's stuff like this or a Banksy, it has to go. Do you view that as art or vandalism? I see that as art because it makes that building look a lot nicer with that pic picture on than it would if it wasn't there. It seems up the wall nicely. It's not just like, you know, some lad's name or the Y on the end or something, you know. Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie reportedly spent a million pounds on Banksy art. At this cafe in Hackney, they're taking no chances, covering his work in perspex like an endangered species. Art critics say washing him off the walls will only add to the Banksy phenomenon. I don't think that Banksy would regard it as sacrilege to remove them. If he did regard it as sacrilege, then his, he would go down in my estimation. I think part of his whole shtick is to produce transient ephemeral art for the streets which is the whole point of street art. Officials say it's not their job to decide if something's art or vandalism but however much the men with the power hoses might like Banksy confined to canvas somehow it seems unlikely. Simon Newton, ITV News, East London. And that's all for now. We are back tonight at 11 o'clock with all the latest news and sport. Until then, from myself and the weekend team, We'll see you later. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. The ITV National Weather is sponsored by E.ON, the energy behind PowerGen. Hello, good evening. A bright, blustery day in store for most of us tomorrow. There'll be some sunshine, but there'll be showers around as well, especially up in the north and west. And more than just showers overnight tonight, we've got some more heavy bursts of rain coming into the southwest later this evening. They'll move in from the southwest, sort of late evening, across to the southeast by the end of the night. Perhaps even some thundery downpours around. The rest of Britain, there are clear spells between the showers. It's still breezy, though, and it's a chilly night. Temperatures down to just five or six in places. And then for tomorrow, well, there'll be some sunshine for us all tomorrow. The southeast, perhaps starting off on a wet note, but soon becoming brighter through the morning. And then sunshine and showers. Most of the showers up in the north and west, but a breezy day and feeling chilly. Temperatures around 13 at best tomorrow. The ITV National Weather is sponsored by E.ON, the energy behind PowerGen.